Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma bada habita fillah Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Continue on in our study of Bulugam Aram The Book of Marriage And we are in the Bab of uh, Hidana The Bab or the um, chapter 14 of guardianship, the chapter of guardianship. And we took some of the ahadith uh, regarding guardianship and we mentioned some of the Islamic rulings pertinent to guardianship. And with the remainder of the chapter, the remainder of ahadith, we'll continue on and study the explanations of these hadith uh, or the fiqh that is obtained from these hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in the end of the chapter we will uh, recap some of the important points regarding Hidana to keep ourselves fresh uh, of and abreast of what we covered and what is of most importance for us in understanding this very important chapter of guardianship and we reach the 989th hadith narrated Rafi' bin Sinan radiyallahu ta'ala an he accepted Islam but his wife refused to accept it the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam then made the mother sit down to a side and the father to another side and made the son sit down between them he, the son, then inclined to his mother. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, O oh Allah, give him guidance. Then he inclined to his father and he took him. Abu Dawood and Nisa'i reported it. Al-Hakam graded it as authentic or sahih. This hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is a Hadith Adim, and this great Hadith has many many benefits uh, that can be abstracted from this Hadith uh, of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in this Hadith, the the Hadith narrated by Rafi ibn Sinan, رضي الله uh, he he uh, accepted Islam, but his wife had refused to accept Islam. So Rafi had accepted Islam and he was married at the time and his wife remained a disbeliever and so the Prophet Sallallahu had them both sit down the husband uh, Rafi and the wife and his wife and their child their son sat between them and then the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw that the boy, Rafi's uh, son, was inclining towards mother. And as we stated before, and as is well known, the mercy and rahmah of the mothers is greater than that of the fathers. And this just tends to be the general tabi'i or uh, nature of people, that women tend to be more merciful and more inclined to be governed by their emotions more so than men and with this being the case Rafi, <coughs> his son uh, inclined towards the mother when they sat between them because they were going to uh, arbitrate uh, regarding uh, guardianship as they had uh, they were splitting and then the Prophet والسلام, supplicated and said, O oh Allah, guide him. You know, guide this boy to make the, the best uh, of decisions. So this was the dua of the Prophet والسلام, whose dua was accepted by Allah And then the, uh, then the boy uh, had, uh, then he inclined towards the father. And so this was the Prophet ﷺ's dua being accepted. 
from this hadith are immense benefits and also uh, a very important uh, principle that the scholars uh, mention with regards to the situation uh, in the hadith of Rafa. So this hadith, one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows that if the father, uh, especially uh, if the father or the mother is a disbeliever, that the general ruling is that the guardianship does not go to them. Again, if the father or the mother is a disbeliever, then the child does not go to them. And this is due to the fact that a child will incline towards, of course, the one they're being raised. And we see this, uh, this is uh, derived from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and likewise through tajriba, meaning through practical uh, experience, we see that this is the case, that the child uh, inclines, of course, to what their parents are upon. And so due to this fact, the child, the Muslim child, or it is just mentioned that the that it is the child of them, of the, of the parents, that they will take on the religion of the parent that they're with, the whoever's their guardian. So if the child had remained with... Uh, the the mother and she was a pagan or she was a christian or a jew then more than likely the child would be raised as a christian or a jew or a pagan whatever the religion is or the way of life uh, that the mother has and so this is from this this uh the scholars they mention that it is uh uh not permissible then in, the, in, a, in a situation similar to this, where there's a husband that is a Muslim and the wife is a, uh, uh, for example, a Christian or something, the child should go to the father automatically. There shouldn't be a choice given. And so that uh, is an exception in regards to that asl that we talked about in the prior lessons, that foundation principle which is that the uh, when there's a divorce, that the child goes uh, with the mother. This is the asl because of their mercy. But in the case that the mother uh, is a disbeliever, then the child would go with the father. And Ben Othaymin mentions a very benefit, uh, beneficial, uh, a side benefit. He says that if it is said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not uh, prohibit the child from having a choice, you know, the ch from an inclining towards the mother. Okay, so this is a very important issue to address. That in this hadith, we see that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not prohibit the child uh, from having a choice, and did not prohibit the child from inclining towards uh, his mother, which was the natural inclination because of the the mercy of the mothers and the closeness that the children have towards their mothers. So, Abin Othimin then mentions that the uh, the Prophet وسلم, rather he made a supplication and uh, that the Prophet وسلم, his supplications are accepted. And that is in comparison or similar to uh, the same status of being a prohibition. Because the Prophet ﷺ, uh, you know, his dua is accepted. However, in our situation, our dua may ex be accepted or it may not. So, uh, uh, he sa uh, Ben Othimin mentions that if this were to take place in contemporary times before the judge, then that a woman 
uh, or that a husband uh, became a, a Muslim and the wife or the, the, the ex-wife, she uh, refused to accept Islam and the child inclines towards his mother, then uh, that would not be the case. Just uh, by default, the child would go to the believing parent. And so, and this is uh, related to one of the fawaid that we'll talk about. So I hope that that is clear. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that uh, it shows that it is a condition that the guardian over the child uh, be a Muslim. They must be uh, a Muslim. Meaning that if the child is a Muslim, especially, then the, the guardian must be a Muslim. This is uh, the main point. And then, uh, and this is in accordance with other ahadith, uh, hadith of the Prophet والسلام, who said, talked about the, about uh, guardianship or that parents, that children follow their parents. And the Prophet والسلام, said, and if his father uh, uh, you know, has a certain religion. If he has a Jewish religion, then he will, then the child will grow up a Jew. And if he is a Christian, then the child will grow up a Christian. Or if he is Majus, then the child will grow up as Majus. And likewise, so this is from the Hikmah, the Islamic, the, the wisdom of the Prophet والسلام, And this is the Hikmah that is carried on in the Islamic ruling is that the child will follow, of course, the parents that they're raised with uh, in general, especially in their early stages until they have the intellectual capacity to search on their own or whatever the case may be, that they follow the religion of their parents. And due to this fact, uh, it is impermissible for that it is conditional that the Muslim child be given to the Muslim parent if they have dif difference in the differences in the religion. Uh, another benefit is, uh, and th this is related to that benefit as well, is that this hadith also shows that the guardianship also goes to the person most suitable. So in the in the case that's uh, in this hadith, the one who's most suitable is the one who is a Muslim because they're going to look out for the child's where spiritual well-being to bring them closer to Allah, to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, based on the book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that is their maslaha for the child. Uh, this hadith illustrates for us that the general maslaha of the child must be considered that the person who is most suitable. So as we spoke about prior to this regarding the other ahadith in this chapter is that when you have for example, two Muslim parents, uh, maybe the mother, and we know cases like this, where the mother was, was unsuitable, that she was uh, perhaps a, 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 someone who abuses drugs, perhaps her manners are very bad and she mixes with men, she's a loose woman, or perhaps she uh, just has bad manners in general, curses, and doesn't observe Islamic practices, maybe prays sometimes, and other times she doesn't pray. Or the opposite. So in either one of those cases, the one who's the most suitable, that this is the maqsud of the Havana. So it isn't, uh, we know what the, the asal is, as we've talked about, of the child going to the mother. But of course, if the religion, if her religion is not Islam, or she is not on istiqamah, she's not straight in her religion, she's uh, a fasika, or she is a, a sinner, you know, someone who has a uh, sin, or mubtadi'a, uh, or something like this, then this must be considered in the guardianship of the child. Those are the main benefits of that uh, hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Al-Bara uh, bin, uh, bin Azib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave a ruling regarding Hamza's daughter in favor of her maternal aunt. 
saying the maternal aunt is in the position of the mother. Al-Bukhari reported it. Ahmed reported it from the hadith of Ali radiallahu ta'ala He said the little girl must be with her maternal aunt for the maternal aunt is the same as the mother. So this hadith here is very important as this hadith illustrates for us that the maternal mother is to the, like the status of the mother. So in the case of the mother's absence, say the mother dies, say whatever the case may be, or the mother proves to be unsuitable, then, uh, and there is a suitable uh, biological sister who's willing to care for the child, then she will, uh, uh, then the child will go to the, uh, to the aunt, to the maternal aunt. So this is very important. Uh, this hadith, uh, one of the benefits of this hadith is it shows that if there is uh, that uh, that from this hadith we see that this hadith shows that the one who is uh, more right, uh, more not just responsible, but they are more deserving, they have a more right to the guardianship that they should fulfill the guardianship. Okay, that's what we learn from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said that uh, Al-Khalatu bi manzilatil um The Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said the maternal aunt is the uh, is in is in the position or the same status as the mother. So we see from this hadith that she has uh, a greater right in this situation if she is able to do so, uh, and so on. Uh, another benefit of this hadith. is this hadith shows uh, also uh, the justice of the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, wasalam and that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam concerned himself with justice uh, and this was illustrated from the hadith of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala who is from the best of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and it was arbitrated uh, that in the hadith of Ali radiallahu ta'ala who said the little girl must be with her maternal aunt for the maternal aunt is the same as the mother so this shows that the the, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam was concerned with justice and his companions radiallahu ta'ala who were concerned with justice and practicing justice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy and uh, upon them all. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is it shows uh, it shows that there is a preference for the female guardianship over the male if the original guardian uh, if if they're on the on the same uh, status if they're of the same status so here in the situation uh, the maternal aunt has this right even though the father it's his child but the maternal aunt her closeness to the mother and just the fact that she's a woman and the sister of the mother, that if she is suitable, then she has that, that right to take to care for the child. And this just goes to show that Islam gives uh, preference to the one who generally is going to have the most mercy. The most mercy and uh, be more suitable for... Uh, that kind of uh, giving that kind of affection and treatment to the child. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that the maternal aunt that she has the status 
uh, uh, of the mother. And this is in accordance to the statement of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. In the 991st hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala'an, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, when one servant serves him with his food, if he does not make him sit down with him and eat, he should sit down with him and eat. He should give him one or two morsels of it. Uh, Mutafiqun alayhi agreed upon and the wording is al-Bukhari's. Uh, this hadith shows us the uh, mercy of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the mercy of Islam. That Islam is not about uh, arrogance and abuse and placing burdens and hardships on people, but rather Islam is justice and is based upon wisdom, al-hikmah, which is putting everything in its rightful place. So this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam shows us that it is permissible to have a servant. And this could be a servant as we see what's practiced uh, especially uh, all over the world in fact. Uh, that people are servants as far as they are paid servants. This is not uh, a type of slavery. Being a servant is... Uh, is uh, different than being someone who is uh, a slave. And so if someone is a paid servant, like is very common here in Saudi Arabia, that people have servants, and that means they deserve their wages and they deserve right and just treatment in accordance with their contract. And nothing that it should be in their contract or in their treatment which violates Islam. Uh, so this hadith shows for us that it is permissible to use someone else uh, if you are paying a servant, for example. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that uh, the servant That they are, to, if someone has a, a trusted servant and there's no reason to have any suspicion, then that they should trust their servant. Meaning that if their servant uh, serves their food, they should not be suspicious of the food. And they should not be uh, paranoid. As long as there is no reason to go against that asl, against that, uh, uh, against that, uh, that, that foundation principle, that there should be no suspicion there, that this, their servant should be someone who is trusted. Uh, another benefit and uh, from this hadith is it also shows that uh, a person should be mutawadha, that they should be a person who is humble. People should be humble. And so not illustrating arrogance, and uh, these kind of wretched traits, which unfortunately many people fall into, and especially with regards to servants. There are countless examples uh, in many communities where people abuse their servants and treat them as slaves and, and abuse them physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, and this is uh, a tremendously sinful practice. So it's very important for us to know, and we gain from this hadith, that the servant must be cared for. That the one who has servants, for example, a driver or a cook or a maid or whatever the case may be, that they must give them their rights, uh, and that includes their pay and what, whatever is owed to them, and that it also includes their dignity, and it includes their food. That, that as the Prophet والسلام, mentioned that uh, if he does not make him sit down with him to, to eat with him, 
then he should make sure that he gives him some morsels of food, meaning that he must give something from his food. And that should not be something which is oppressive, meaning uh, that doesn't mean that you actually give a person two bites of food and you are eating big things, but it, it's, it's in relation to what you have, meaning that you must supply those you're charged over uh, for, that you must care for them. Uh, another benefit uh, of this uh, hadith is just showing us the importance of giving everyone their due rights. Uh, in the last hadith in this uh, chapter, narrated Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, a woman was punished on account of a cat which she held captive till it died. Hence she entered the hellfire due to her mistreatment of the cat. She did not feed it or give it water while she held it captive, nor did she let it out so that it may eat the things that creep on the earth. Mutafakun uh, In this hadith that's in Bukhari and Muslim, it shows that even animals, they have rights. And that this is a grievous sin to, if a woman actually went to hell and was punished due to a cat, that shows that animals have rights as well in Islam. And that we should be uh, kind and respectful to animals and not uh, torture them and not harm them for any undue reason that does not prohibit hunting for food. But trophy hunting, no. That does not prohibit uh, 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 you know, slaughtering the animal for food but out of cruelty and beating and harming animals and making things difficult and causing them stress, that this is harmful and sinful. And the Prophet ﷺ said, La darar wa la dirar. There is no harm and there's no reciprocating harm. And that's a general principle in the Sharia. And that it is very important for us to take all of that in consideration when treating human beings and animals, that they all have rights. Uh, from this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam is this hadith illustrates for us uh, the punishment that there is a punishment in the hellfire. There is such a thing as hellfire and there is such a thing as punishment as people being punished in the hellfire. And we know this because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned this that this woman was uh, punished in the fire due to this. She entered the fire because of this. And we, so we know from this and from the ample evidence in the Quran and the Sunnah to show that there is a hellfire and that there are people and jinn that will be punished in the fire. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also, uh, illust uh, this hadith also illustrates for us the impermissible of tying up animals uh, and restricting their movement when there's the potential that they will be uh, killed or destroyed or harmed. Meaning, for example, uh, if there is, for example, severe cold, severe weather, and you just leave your animals out there, uh, you know, without any, uh, maybe you, if you're ignorant to the fact that's different to the severity of the weather and it, uh, something happened, but to knowingly torture or cause harm and not give the animals their rights and their chances, then this is harmful. Or for example, you know a fire is coming and you leave your animal tied, okay, or in a cage to be burned, that this is a, a great evil and a sin and it is impermissible. It is muharram. Uh, uh, another, other examples are in, in as was the case in this hadith where the woman she left the the child the, the cat was was uh tied or in a cage or what have you it was restricted she held it captive and she did not feed it or give it drink so the cat just wasted away starved to death or or, or you know starved to death basically malnutrition and whatever 
So this, this uh, cruelty, this is haram. We learn from this hadith that that is haram. And this is a nus to show us so. Because unfortunately many people don't seem to understand this or practice this. And many people are very, we find this unfortunately in many of the Muslim countries where they stone the, 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 the puppies, stone the dogs, uh, you know, without even a need to do so. Even the dogs are not harmful. Or they, uh, you know, mistreat their donkeys or their horses or whatever the case may be and abuse them. Uh, and so all of these practices are muharram. Uh, another benefit we gain from this hadith is an exception to that, meaning exception to, to tying up the animal or restricting them if the person is giving the animal their wajib, meaning giving them their, their due rights. So, for example, if you have a bird, a parakeet, whatever the case may be, in a cage, or, or you have a cat in your house, or, uh, you know, some dogs, they have to be restrained during the day, but you're caring for that dog. You feed it, you dr give it drink, and you walk it. You give it walks, you know, so it can get exercise and, and, and so forth then you're caring for its needs. So in this case, it's permissible. But uh, to restrain them and cause them harm and stress and difficulty, this is impermissible. And this is what the was the topic of this hadith uh, and what this hadith included from, a, from the means of causing harm uh, to the animals. Uh, Lastly, I want to briefly go over some of the main points regarding Hidana that we covered of custody. And one of the first things is that the mother has more right to custody of her child so long as she does not remarry. Meaning so long as the mother does not uh, get married again, then she, from the asal we mentioned, she has the most right. And as long as she's suitable and in the other details we mentioned. And it is reported on the authority of Amr ibn Shu'ayb, who reported on the authority of his father, who in turn reported on the authority of his grandfather, Abdullah ibn Amr, uh, that a woman said, O Messenger of Allah, my womb was a vessel to this son of mine, my breast a water skin for him, and my lap a guard for him. Uh, yet his father has divorced me and wants to take him away from me. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, you have more right to him as long as you do not uh, marry. This hadith is Hassan, and this is the hadith that we studied uh, hadith uh, narrated by Abu Dawood, Wa Ahmed, Al Bayhaqi, and Al Hakim. Al Hakim. Uh, Ibn al Mansur, uh, uh, Ibn al uh, Mansur, or Ibn al uh reported that there is consensus among scholars that her right is invalidated by marriage, meaning that there's a consensus from the ulama, and Ibn Mundur said there is ijma uh, that. A woman, if she remarries, then the custody goes to the father. Uh, uh, another benefit we gain from this hadith, I mean from this uh, chapter, is a person with most right to custody of the child after the mother is the maternal aunt. And that's the, one of the had, a, a hadith we just studied. It's reported on the uh, authority of al Bara ibn Azib that he said, so the Prophet ﷺ went out of Mecca, the daughter of Hamza ran after them. The Prophet Sallallahu and his companions calling, O oh, uncle, O oh, uncle. Ali radiallahu ta'ana received her and led her by the hand and said to Fatima radiallahu ta'ana, take your uncle's daughter. Zaid and Jafar quarreled radiallahu ta'ana quarreled about her. Ali radiallahu ta'ana said, I have more right to her as she is my uncle's daughter. Jafar radiallahu ta'ana said, she is my uncle's daughter and her aunt is my wife. Zaid said, she is my brother's daughter. The Prophet uh, judged that she should be given to her aunt and said, Al Khalatu bi manzalatil um, that the maternal aunt is like the mother. And then he said to Ali, Anta minni wa ana minka, and you are from me and I am from you. And he said to Jafar, uh, Ashabahta. Uh, Khalki wa khulki. You resemble me both in character 
and appearance. And he said to Zaid, Enta Ahuna wa Molana. You are our brother in faith and our freed slave. This is an authentic hadith. This is a hadith in uh, Bukhari and a Tirmidhi and al Bayhaqi. Uh, the third important point that was uh, emphasized in these groups, uh, in this group of uh, hadith uh, about Hidana, is that the person with the most right to custody at the ch of the child after the mother and the maternal aunt is the father. Uh, this is inferred from the hadith of Abdullah bin Amr, in which he stated, uh, which it was stated that the mother has a greater right to custody of the ch child so long as she does not marry. And likewise, the hadith of Bara al Bara ibn Azab uh, supports the view that the maternal aunt is like the mother with regard to custody. Uh, another benefit from this chapter is those with the most right to custody of the child are his close kin if there is no mother, maternal aunt or father. This is due to the child's need for someone to take custody of him and raise him, and his close kin are more compassionate towards him, so the judge should appoint one of them whom he deems to be best suited uh, to take care of the child for his physical well-being must be taken into account, just as his financial well-being must be, as proven by the evidence is supported, uh, reported regarding orphans in the books, in the book of Allah and the Son of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and of course his spiritual well-being, as we mentioned. Uh, the fifth point, uh, important point derived from these ahadith is a child may choose between his father and mother after he reaches the age of independence. This is based upon the hadith of Abu Huraira who reported that the Prophet ﷺ gave a boy the choice between living with his father and his mother. This is an authentic hadith. In another version, a, a woman came and said, O Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my husband wishes to take my son, and he draws water for me from the well of Abu uh, Inaba, and he has been good to me. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, cast lots for him. Her husband said, who is disputing with me about my son? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is your father and this is your mother, so take the hand of whichever of them you wish. So he took his mother's hand and she went away with him. This is an authentic hadith. Uh, narrated Abu Dawood and Nisa'i. And those are the main uh, benefits derived uh, from that hadith. Thus ends our study of the chapter of, uh, of, of marriage, the book of marriage. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it a benefit for us and bless us with ikhlas wa thabat ala sunnah nabi. صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم